Okay, so welcome back to our study on Discipleship 101. We started it in the book in January itself on discipleship because I think because of the COVID and everything else, it is important for us to understand that our call is more than just to gather in church. Our call is to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus said, you know, go into all the world and make disciples. And that's why we got to go back to the mandate that Christ has given to us to make disciples of people, not just to get people to accept Christ, say a prayer, sin a prayer, then we say the person is now a believer and then let them be on their own. The Bible says make disciples of all ethnic groups. Every group of people must understand that they need to become followers of Jesus Christ because he is uh, our creator. He's not just our savior, but he is the one with without him. There was nothing made that was made. He was in the beginning with God. He is the one that created, brought all things into being. And we function without him. There is no life. Right in him is life, the Bible talks about. And so we thank God that we have already decided in our minds and in our hearts that Jesus Christ is not only our Savior, but he's also our Lord, and he's worthy not only to be worshipped, but he's also worthy to be followed after. The plan of God Almighty is that we become more and more like Jesus in our character. He is called the last Adam. There is one, the first Adam, and the last Adam. There is no second or third Adam. It's just the first and the last Adam. So we become more uh, like him because he restored man. He came to restore man back into the position that we lost in the first Adam. Okay, so now we're coming into our study on discipleship. Last week, we went into the first two points in our study on the disciples' priority. One of the major things that, the, I mean, the number one thing about a disciple is, we said he must have such a desire for the word of God. He must have a desire for God's word. He must desire it as a babe desires milk. Uh, we began with that. And then we also talked about how Peter is trying to help us to have this desire in our hearts. So he began, we began by talking about the first two points, and that was remember your life source. Remember your life source. And uh, John chapter 6, verse 63, one of the scriptures that we mentioned in our last study, where Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are life. They are spirit, they are life. The words that I speak, it's life. Now, not only does the word of God, uh, I mean, did the word of God bring us the new birth, but it is also our sustenance for life. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, we know that scripture so well, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, the uh, Passion Translation says this, true life is found in every word which is constantly uh, proceeding out of the mouth of God. True life is found in this, in the word that is constantly flowing from the mouth of God. And we need to understand that, that God, that our life, our Christian life is not only, uh, has not only begun through the word of God, but it is also sustained by the word of God. So we started by saying this, Peter wants us to uh, remember our life source. This is our life source. So because it's my life source, I must desire, just like I desire uh, air, uh, you know, I must have air or I cannot live. I must have water or I will die. I must have food in the same, for our physical beings to function. So our spiritual man, we must have the Holy Spirit, which is the breath of God. We must have the word of God in order for us to live. It is our life source. Remember your life source. The second thing we talked about was remove every hindrance that, that's there. Anything that would hinder you from uh, really desiring any any sometimes you know when you have eaten too much of everything else then when the real deal comes out uh, you don't really enjoy it I, I, as i shared with you before when one of our first trips to sarawak and we went up to the limbang area lawas area and then they took us up to uh, bakalalan side all right now when, when we went into the lawas area the, the lunbawang people are so hospitable i've never met a more hospitable people than the lunbawang people and uh, they begin a meal before that you know they, they will serve us 
they are what we call like a breakfast, okay? So out comes the Milo, the biscuits, the uh, uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, bread, whatever they have cooked, little uh, dishes, cakes, whatever they have. And, and we thought that's breakfast, all right? So so we eat and we eat until we are quite full already. Then we are very happy. Uh, and then they tell us, okay, now everybody go outside. And we go outside and we wait outside. And, and we're thinking that it's going to be time for service. They said, no, 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 that was just the appetizer. <laughs> and, then, and then we come back inside, and my goodness, man, they wake up so early, four o'clock uh, in the morning and start preparing chicken and, and, and meat and pork and all the big dishes, man, and, and rice, so much of rice, and that is breakfast. But we had already eaten so much earlier that now it's so hard to eat the the best stuff that comes out <laughs> following that dish. Uh, earlier, we thought that was already very good, but then now comes the real stuff that they put on the table. I'm sure you know when you go for a Chinese meal, if you've never been uh, to like a uh, big wedding dinner or anything else, they come out with the first dish. If we've never been, we think, well, this is the main thing. You know, we start to eat a lot of that, and then comes the next and the next. And the, you've got about nine to 11, 12 dishes. My Lord, you know. And, and the best stuff comes a little bit later. But we have already lost our appetite because we've already fed on so many other things. So that's why we can also lose our appetite for the Word of God. And, and that must be our number one priority. We must desire sincerely the pure milk of the Word of God. So remove every other hindrance so that there will be a clear path or a good appetite for the good stuff. Number three, today recognize my need. Now, he doesn't just say, Peter does not just say as babes, he says as newborn babes. And the word that he uses is brephos, which means an unborn fetus or a newborn infant. Think with me for a while. He's writing this in what we call barbaric times, what we would refer to in comparison to what we have today. Those were like barbaric times. 2,000 over years ago, many mothers would die at childbirth. They didn't have formulas. They didn't have milk bottles as such, you know. And, and so what they would have is just a mother's milk until a child is weaned off a mother's breast. Oh, his mother's breast. Un until the child is weaned. We call the child has now been weaned. It does not need this milk anymore. Then that word brephos is no longer used for that baby. All right. Even though the baby, uh, uh, you know, is still a baby, but does not need the mother's milk anymore. Then we, they would refer to that child uh, no, no longer as a brephos. Okay. So it is only used. Peter is using a term of an infant that is still at its mother's breast. As newborn babes, he says, you have got to decide. Now, as I said earlier, the baby does not care. Does not even care what mommy's face looks like and definitely does not care what daddy's face looks like. Uh, that's why babies cry when they want to see daddy's face. Okay, but anyway, it does not care the color of its skin. It does not care about its hair, whether it has hair or does not have hair, you know. It does not care that the skin is is a little bit bigger for, for it. When it comes out, it's got like shriveled skin. It does not look very nice until it starts to fill up, uh, uh, you know. But the baby doesn't care about that. It's not embarrassed by how it looks. It comes out into the world naked, naked. Uh, exit into the world and they're not embarrassed that they are naked. They just scream and what do they want? The first thing they want is mommy's milk. So that is their desperate need. The desperate need is I must have the pure milk of mommy. And so that Peter is saying, I want you to have that kind of a desperate, recognize this need that, that is there in your spirit, man. Sometimes it's so dormant, we don't even realize that that is what we need. And he's trying to awaken it. This must become a desperate need in our hearts. And this, of course, you know, there are two basic ingredients for that milk. One is for nourishment so that the child can continue to get stronger and be nourished. It can only be nourished by mother's milk at that time. And the second thing about it is there are antibodies in that mother's milk. When the baby starts to drink that, some of it is just white, it's just plain, uh, almost colorless liquid that comes out. It's like water. But still, there is such a rich, uh, that it is so rich in its antibodies that protects the baby from... Uh, any kind of infection that comes on. So one 
Remember your, your life source. Number two, remove every hindrance. Number three, recognize my need. Number four, I have to reach for growth. I have to reach for growth. For this milk, in uh, translation, uh, Passion Translation says this in verse 2, For this milk will cause you to grow into maturity, fully nourished and strong for life. You know, God's plan is that we become mature. John chapter 1 verse 12, For as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become sons of God. We often say, well, once we receive Christ, we become children of God. Full stop. No, 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 no. To become sons of God. Not to be, not, not to, as many as received him, they become. It is they are becoming. They shall become to, to become sons of God. And, and we are becoming, we are growing, we are maturing. There must be a growth in our spiritual life. And that's why I say we often got to check our prayer life. Is my prayer life the same as it was, you know, when I first got saved? Am I still praying baby talk? If I were to be asked to lead in prayer, what would my prayer sound like? Will I be stumbling over the words because I've not been practicing my prayer life in his presence? See? So all these things would begin to uh, uh, come into effect. We have to take it as our personal responsibility. You know, there's an Irish saying, doesn't matter how tall your grandfather was, you've got to do your own growing. Doesn't matter how tall grandpa was. I've got to do my own growing. It is a personal responsibility. So Paul speaks about himself. He speaks about in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, man, not, not like I myself have already attained. I am pressing on. I, I am reaching out. I, I want to reach the place where God can say, you know, this is good. You're growing in me. Talking about that, did you know that Jesus, it says at the beginning after he is found in the temple and all that, it says that Jesus grew he grew in favor. We grow in favor with God and with man. And I think this is a sign of maturity when we grow in favor with God and with man. So it's a growing process, uh, you know, where God begins to say, okay, now I can trust you with different things. Like uh, I think Jonathan who preached that God does not have favorites, but we grow in favor as we begin to show God that we can be trusted with different things. Uh, we can be trusted with authority. We can be trusted with certain wealth in our lives. We can be trusted with certain blessings. All right. So we grow in our maturity. You cannot uh, put put the keys to a car in the hands of a teenager. I mean, you know, 13, 14 years old, you put the keys inside their hands and they are gone. They destroy it. All right. Uh, I know of, I remember at one time, Pastor Alan Tan was sharing about how he was coming down the Guam Musang Highway and, and he saw these kids at the back coming down on motorcycles. You know, they are lying down. And I think there were two or three of them and they overtook him and overtook another car, but the last guy did not manage to overtake, hit another car right face on. The guy flew into his spot. The kid died. Pastor Ellen also had to go to the police station. And there's this, this, the father coming and crying. The son was underage, didn't have a license. See, see, that's why they, they, uh, we, God cannot entrust, you know, he cannot, we, that, that you don't find favor that God can trust you yet. So oh, trust me. So I need to grow in, in favor. And so he prays for us. He prays in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, where he talks about my little children of whom again I travail that Christ can be formed in you. His cry, Galatians 4, 19, is that Christ can be formed in us. In other words, he is being formed a little at a time. Here a little, there a little. We are growing in the Lord. Now here are some evidences. Very quickly, let me just give them to you. Evidences that I am growing in the Lord. One overflows into the other. The first thing is, there is an increase in my understanding of the Word of God. What happens is that comes as I begin to desire the Word of God. How do I know that I'm growing? My, my desire is growing for God's Word. There comes a deeper, uh, uh, richer understanding of the Word of God. It begins to increase in my life. As I begin to discover greater spiritual truths, you know, uh, coming into my uh, understanding, I begin to say, oh, this is wonderful. I realize that God is now speaking to me. When I read the Word of God, it's no longer just 
uh, black dots on a white page, but God is now starting to speak to me. And I begin to understand, ah, now I see this, ah, now I see that, all right? So uh, there is an increase in my understanding. Then that overflows into a deeper delight in pursuing more. So now that you come into a deeper understanding of the Word of God, you say, okay, man, this is great stuff. And so you want to have a little bit more. You not only read the Word of God, you look up, a, you get yourself a little concordance, you get a little study book, you get other books that you want to read concerning different topics, you know. I love the old classics. I love the old old time preachers and, and their writings because they are so deep in the understanding of God and how God works. And when I read that, every time I read that, man, sometimes tears will stream down my cheeks and I would say, Oh Lord, help me to understand you the way these guys understood you. Huh? There, there comes a deeper understanding of God. I'll never forget standing in a in this church where there were about maybe uh, 15, 20 people, all of them were 80 years old, uh, 70, 80 years old and above. The pastor, as I said, he was in his 70s and he was the youngest <laughs> in the church, in this Welsh church. But anyway, they were there and then they got one of the people to pray. I think he, he must have been about 90 years old or 80 some, 90 years old and got him to lead in prayer. And the way he prayed, when he began to pray, I'm the guest speaker, but when he began to pray, I felt like I was in kindergarten. His understanding of God, man. I mean, it was unbelievable. And you know what? One of the things that helps us in our understanding, helped me in my understanding, were the hymns we used to sing. And then when we sing that hymns, those hymns help me build a greater uh, uh, understanding, greater doctrine in my own being, you know, to appreciate God uh, for who he is. So there also comes not only an increase in my understanding, deeper in pursuing more, there comes a greater love for God. Once the word of God becomes richer to you and you begin to start to love it and you want to get more out of it there will come an increased love for God a greater love for God no doubt about it you begin to say God now I begin to understand who you are I used to see you know only maybe the dark side of God that God is hard or God is harsh but now I begin to read more and I understand more and oh how much I appreciate you amazing grace really becomes amazing to you and of course the fourth thing that happens is there comes an established faith faith comes by hearing and hearing not other people's stories but hearing the word of God and your faith begins to get established. You can go through hell or high water and yet at the same time say, God has already promised. I know God. His word is true. It is the word of God that will carry you through. Number five, recall your blessings. So he says in First Peter chapter 2 and verse 3, if you have tasted of the kindness of the Lord. He's talking about what? Desiring the word of God. Desiring, longing for God's word. Then he says, man, if you think about the kindness of God, think about it. It will cause you to want to know more of the word of God. He's basically referring, as I said, to Old Testament scriptures, because that's the only scriptures they had. He's referring to Psalm chapter 34 and verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I like Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7. This is what he says, throughout the coming ages, we will be the visible display of the infinite, limitless riches of his grace and kindness, which he has showered upon us in Christ Jesus. Have you felt like you have been showered in the kindness and the grace of God? The kindness and the grace of God. So think about all the times. I like to say, you know, survey how kind God has been to you. Lamentations chapter 3, 22 and 23. You know, your faithfulness is new every morning. It talks about, you know, your compassions, they fail not. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. We sing about that. They are new every morning. The blessings of the Lord. Survey them. Survey the blessings that are upon you. Ephesians 1.13, Praise be to God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. First Timothy 6.17, uh, Put their hope in God which richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Isn't that a fantastic word? God has provided all things freely for our enjoyment. God is consistently, constantly, lavishly kind to all of us. Number six, richly cherish your privilege. Richly cherish your privilege. So verses four and verse five, he talks about us being living stones. We are a holy 
priesthood. Now, this is against a backdrop. Peter is writing this to them against a backdrop that they understood very well, a backdrop of idolatry. Uh, idols of stone. Now we have a stone that is living, a living stone, Jesus himself. Against an immoral priesthood that was in operate, that was operating at that time to a holy priesthood. Pastor Lifan and I had the privilege of being in Turkey, visiting the seven churches. And one of the places we went to was Ephesus. And in Ephesus, you know, a lot of the places are still there. You, you know, archaeologists have done a tremendous job. And, and you see basically the temple of Artemis or Diana. Uh, you've got all the houses that they stayed in. They had toilet facilities, different from ours, but still they had proper sewage system. And then you come down to the temple of Diana. And across the temple of Diana was this big uh, library. And what they had was they had an underground tunnel from the temple leading up to the library. All right. Now, very often the, the men would go to the temple of Diana and they would tell their wives they were going to the library. So in case the wives or whatever came, they would get their people to tell them the wives are coming. They would run from the temple right into the library and be found there. Simple reason being in the temple, they practiced uh, sodomy, pedophilia. Uh, they had prostitution, harlotry, we call it. All kinds of sexual immoral morality was being practiced in the name of worship. It was provided for them so that they bring in great amounts of finances uh, for the temple. Now, remember at that time, the priest was such a powerful thing. Now, at that time, we need to know the priest had full access to God. It was called coming to God or ekomai, which means to come next. We have uh, been given this priesthood where we can ekomai, which means I can come near to God, come next to God. Come next to God. The priest stood as the most, as I, I think I shared this with you earlier, the priest was such a powerful person. That's why, you know, religion, the, the religious uh, authorities used their power to rule over kings and cause all kinds of atrocities to be done in the name of religion. All right, whether it's the Christian faith or any other faith, that's what happened. So now he's talking about the, the privilege that we have as believers. He's saying, man, listen, you've got such a tremendous, tremendous privilege. Cherish your privilege. You are now the holy priesthood. What a tremendous privilege it is. Now the word, uh, let, let me give you the definition of privilege. P privilege is a right granted as a pick as a peculiar benefit, a right granted as a peculiar benefit, advantage or favor to accord a higher value or superior position. And so he says, guys, listen, and you guys have been given such a tremendous privilege. That's why you need to have a greater love and cherish, uh, you know, the word of God greatly. You got to long for it, man, because this is your great privilege. So richly cherish your privileges. All right. So here are those things, the six things that he gives to us so that we can understand what the blessing of the Lord uh, that we have received from him. He says, now all these things, I hope these things will help you develop such a longing for the word of God. All right. Okay, so I trust that the lesson has been a blessing to you. Here are some personal questions, which, you know, we kind of talked about it uh, in our last session together. But here it is. We are going back to the beginning itself. And uh, the question that we asked here is, do I have anything remotely like this kind of craving for the word of God? If there's an invitation to attend a Bible study or another to go out and mark on fellowship, how will it be? So having made efforts, question number two, to improve your spiritual, uh, your physical health, what efforts have I made to grow spiritually? Can I think about ways in which I have really tried to grow spiritually? Do I deliberately make efforts to understand the word of God? What kind of efforts have I been making? How are they being made? All right. Let's talk about this together. Blessings.